Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Sovlin, United Nations Fleet Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, January 15, 2137. I was claiming an unwanted milestone with this voyage, I was certain I was the furthest below water of any Gojid, who hadn't already been dead and sinking, in history. Some predators were monitoring their scanners for the slightest sign of activity, though I was told an entire team was dedicated to sonar monitoring in a separate chamber too. Sitting in a dark room with headphones for hours, with no idea what was happening, sounded awful. The supervisory officials and secondary team here got a much better deal. Additionally, fire control technicians oversaw guidance systems on the bridge. Most of their work was grounded in electronic and digital concerns. From what Anso had told me, this vessel had underwater missiles which were connected to the ship computer by wires. Once the payload got close enough to the target, an onboard homing mechanism took over. By watching the various stations, I was beginning to decipher bits and pieces from their screens. Judging by the learning curve, anyone with training in starship sensors could adjust to sonar after a few days, in a pinch. Anso seemed aware of most duties, having studied up on the intricacies, I was grateful for his explanations. All the same, it was of some comfort that Tyler, Samantha, and Carlos were in unfamiliar territory too. We're getting close to the presumed location of the Farsal base, Carlos whispered. There's no telling what they're hiding down here. Maybe it's everything that's been done to every species. Anso flicked his ears. A proper database would help with bringing our culture back, exactly as it was. They're the historian species, so it's a good place to go digging. They have a weapon as great as any Colshan tech, information. The baseline for every civilization that has ever lived. I wonder what they have on humanity. Perhaps one or two things that are true. Sam snickered. Tyler pinched the bridge of his nose. What made them so certain we died in nuclear Armageddon? How much did they hide about us? I don't know, but my ship's doctor wrote a paper in an ethics class about why it was morally just to execute you for your aggression. They didn't teach anything good about you, I offered. Samantha beamed with mock excitement. Wow, what a splendid ethics class, and a rousing thesis by the good-hearted doctor. Meanwhile, our physicians swear an oath to do no harm. I'm glad that prey are so much more well-versed on right and wrong. Tyler struck a puzzled expression. I took an ethics class in college, before I dropped out of that shithole to piss off my old man. Best decision of my life. Anyhow, there were some interesting dilemmas they brought up in that class. The trolley problem is about if it's ethical to ever do harm, but for good, you know? I don't. What's the trolley problem? I ask. There's a train going down a track toward five people. You can pull a lever so it only hits one dude on another path instead. Should you? Why does anyone have to get run over by a train? Did Anso make this garbage up? The yodel flashed his teeth with a growling sound, pinning his ears back against his head. I didn't see why my question was objectionable, he was the one with an affinity for outdated trains, to the detriment of advancement. The marsupial made a point of lamenting railroad destruction when we first met. Oh, fuck off. Tyler rolled his blue eyes, and raised his hands in exasperation. Your ethics classes wanted to genocide our whole planet. Carlos nodded. And us predators talk about killing the least amount of people. Even I see the irony. The Federation has no redeeming attributes, Sam hissed. Guess we're gonna get to see Baldi's real culture soon. Then we'll know if the rest of the galaxy used to have a brain. My spines bristled, at the thought of uncovering the original Gojid culture. While I knew that the Federation committed similar atrocities as omnivorous and predator races, it was still painful to think of our real history being flaunted in front of me. What if the Terrans could throw past atrocities in my face, and hammer home the fact that a species' empathy wasn't a prevailing factor against cruelty? 
I couldn't imagine how it felt for the predators to continually defend their past. If our past culture was depraved, I don't want it rebuilt or brought back. We could have been like Anso's kind, killing our own people over food. The fact that I was worried about our discoveries meant I'd accepted the ludicrous idea that the farcel had institutions beneath the waves. Perhaps I trusted the humans too much, but it was a rare occasion when they were off the mark. They'd been a reliable source of information, even if they weren't often forthcoming. I studied Captain Fournier as he presided over the bridge, his words on submarine capabilities left me shaken. Understanding why the predators behaved with such a laissez-faire attitude toward extinction was a moot point, worrying for them was the emotion I couldn't squash. I knew the three humans from my shuttle were all from different tribes on Earth. If we won this war and peace prevailed in the galaxy, what was to stop the Terran settlements from pointing doomsday weapons at each other again? Would Samantha and Tyler be trying to kill each other? There were certain crevasses in humanity's history that were like a mirror, when the comparisons were spelled out in plain fashion. However, in this area, I wasn't worried about similarities being unearthed. There was an inherent difference in our species' aggressivity that was evident, given our contrasting sensibilities. It bothered me, knowing that Terrans were not suited to long-term cooperation with each other. Can your aggression ever truly sto? I started to blurt. A sonar supervisor barked words in a commanding voice, after receiving a broadband communique from her team. Two matching acoustic signatures, 2,000 meters out. We've put a tracker on them and forwarded the data to weapons. Captain Fournier clasped his hands behind his back. Two contacts, 2,000 meters out. We'll log the sound patterns in our database. Maintain battle readiness and prepare to fire on my command. With enemy submersibles sighted, the crackpot underwater base theory looked more plausible. Anso's eyes lit up, as the human shipmates coordinated various actions. I could see a security feed of the torpedo bay, where predators were prepared to physically load replacement weapons from racks. The munitions looked massive, even compared to a predator's unyielding frame. Other Terrans were tending to preloaded tubes, hooking up communications cables. The wires do seem a little primitive, but it's stealthy and immune to interference. The predators have extravagant tech, yet it's only used when it's optimal. Much of the necessary procedures and checks could be done by weapon specialists on the bridge. Captain Fournier growled the order to fire two torpedoes, and fire control ejected the munitions through the muzzle doors. Without a viewport, I could only judge the launch's success from received data. From what I could tell, the twin projectiles were propelling themselves in the wrong direction. Anso had noticed my confused gaze. Yeah, they're aimed off kilter, just at first. Makes it difficult for the enemy to tell where the missile came from, to track it. It's like interfering with targeting on a starship. The Yodel's explanation proved correct again. Fire control routed the torpedoes back on course, after their initial journey. The Farsal submarines were oblivious to the incoming weapons, and with our minimalist noise, they might not detect anything until their vessels were annihilated. The predatory nature of this sneak attack wasn't lost on me. The humans operated unseen, not alerting foes to their presence until it was too late. The cables were cut once the torpedoes were in seeking range, the warhead's active sonar was inescapable in close proximity. The pings tipped off the exact enemy locations, and allowed last-second course corrections. Human engineering was perfect in orchestrating a kill, as I never should have doubted. They'd risen to every challenge hurled at them, from bringing drones into spatial warfare, to shield-breaking missiles. The ocean was an old, familiar hunting ground to them, so this fight was both natural and intuitive. Sonar screens lit up with bursts of noise, painting a story of metal cracking like a dropped fruit. The power of our munitions contributed to the explosion's loudness too, that level of energy output was anything but quiet. Stealth was no longer necessary though, with our submarine's proverbial fangs planted in the farsal's throats. I could imagine the two submerged vessels being spliced into shrapnel, 
as the detonations clashed against their plating. Captain Fournier conversed with the sonar supervisor, before turning to the bridge. Two confirmed kills. Continue on a descent course, in the direction of those ships. We go toward them, we'll find the base, I muttered. Anso wagged his tail. We find the base, we save the yodel. We rid ourselves of their influence once and for all. Samantha raised an eyebrow. Assuming they don't wipe digital data or blow up the base, when all is lost. They love scorched earth, lightly suggested by the whole exterminator hoopla. Better destroyed than used by predators. You are irony poisoned. Carlos shook his head lightly. We get to the archives, and we find what we can. Even if they wipe servers, who says our techies can't recover it? Our submarine descended ever deeper, pressing ahead toward the real Farsal archives. Tulsk's moon was falling above us, and space fleets were clashing around the deorbiting body. All the same, the real battle was a handful of stealth ships here, dishing out silent strikes. We remained vigilant for other enemies, knowing we were close to the base's suspected location. If they spotted us first, then they would have a chance to strike before we could. Is there any way to defend against an oncoming torpedo, if the Farsal have such weapons? It seems like you never sense them coming, and you can't, look out a window. Captain Fournier pursed his lips. Sweep the area with an active sonar ping. We need to get a read on the terrain and hopefully, the base's exact location. The sonar supervisor relayed the orders, and Anso tensed up a little. The yodel whispered to me that active pings gave away our position, by transmitting our own sound into the water. However, sailing blind into unknown territory could end us crashing, or missing the base altogether. We had to hold our breath, and pray the farcel wouldn't pick us up. Their capabilities were unknown, but they must possess listening devices for deep water travel to be possible. Knowing that we were more than a thousand meters below water, I didn't want to find out what would happen to us if the ship imploded. It was impressive that it wasn't crushed by the outside pressure already, come to think of it. At this depth, atmospheric pressure couldn't be suitable for land lifeforms. That was a fear I didn't need to dwell on. The acoustic energy illuminated the terrain for our sightless submarine, allowing the predators to map their surroundings. I listened to the bridge chatter, as they scrambled to classify nearby points of interest. Echo sounding confirmed we were close to the ocean bottom, it was level apart from a few elevation shifts. Deep sea invertebrates sprouted skeletons on the sea floor, wherever space was available. The most promising sign was a wide area of unusual signal absorption, which was believed to be the base. As nervous as I was about getting attacked, well out of any sun's eye, it seemed like we'd gotten away with the emitted ping. Perhaps it was foolish to assign human competence to the farcel. Why would they expect to see other vessels on the seafloor, armed with a predator's tech? How could a prey animal even think of using detection methods, which hunted other ships down for making the slightest noise? The sonar supervisor stiffened. Torpedo in the water. Oh stars! At least the humans had picked up a telltale propulsion system from the torpedo, but that meant the farcel knew we were here. While there were other UN submarines en route, none were flanking us or backing us up. The predators better have some insane defensive tactics, or we would wind up in a million pieces. I didn't like the prospect of my lungs being crushed. Brace yourselves for inbound munitions. Captain Fournier growled into a microphone. Return fire toward the source. The Farsal submarine was patrolling just shy of the archive's base, and wasn't, to our knowledge, joined by any comrades. While taking immediate defensive steps, the Terrans dubiously focused on getting their own torpedo into the water. Skepticism marked itself on my face, but Anso leapt to the Predator's defense. The Yodel claimed this counterstrike was to prevent the enemy from firing again. I could feel my heart crawl into my throat, as our own projectile was spit back with haste. Our submarine reoriented itself in the opposite direction, away from the base, 
and fled at maximum speed. The incoming torpedo had the edge and speed, so it seemed futile to run away. I guessed that the munition had limited fuel, even so, its tank wouldn't run dry quick enough. We dove as close to the seafloor as we could risk, and the sharp descent almost made me tumble down the bridge. The Farsol's torpedo was gaining ground, threatening to sink us. Captain Fournier, just like his counterparts in the stars, was cool under pressure, he waited for the munitions to lock onto us. The bearded leader shouted for a sonar decoy to be deployed. As the deceitful device jetted away, I squinted for clues on nearby screens. Per Anso, it unleashed a cloak of bubbles and jamming frequencies, scrambling the missile's sonar-seeking systems. Did it work? I wrapped my claws around Carlos' arm with the bare tattoo, remembering not to cling to Samantha again. I hate water. I'll take death by vacuum any day. Carlos squeezed my paw awkwardly. I don't know if it worked. We always hope for the best, but no combat situation is a guarantee. Just breathe, buddy. Our submersible attempted to skirt the torpedo's search area, while it was hung up on the false targets our decoy provided. We veered well off to the side, and ensured absolute silence. The deep core looped back around, tiptoeing past the range we'd been chased from. There was no sign of an inbound contact following us. I realized we had successfully fooled the munitions' homing logic, I released Carlos' arm at last. Perhaps it had been wise of the Terrans to impart a shot back. Our foes were too preoccupied to send more trouble our way, one torpedo was enough. Those thoughts reminded me that we had taken offensive actions to counter theirs. Sniffing out the vessel that attempted to sink us was a priority. The torpedo we'd fired at the Farsal submarine hadn't found its mark, as the enemy managed to pull nifty evasive maneuvers. However, their engines stirred up ample noise, with that sudden haste. Though they had avoided our first missile, I thought we had a clear target for our next round. However, it was not necessary to expend another weapon on this nefarious submarine. The Terran torpedo missed its target the first time, but it doubled back for another pass without warning. On the second attempt, it struck true into the hapless Farsal's frame, another hostile was ravaged in the blink of an eye. The humans had a perfect sinking score, proving themselves to be the more devious prowlers. I doubted the Farsal expected anyone to get this close to their lair, all we had to do was poke at their defenses from a few angles. If this mop-up was representative of our disparate power, the other UN submarines must be closing in on the base too. In space, losses and hardships could be inflicted upon the predators. However, land and sea appeared to be their chief dominion, where their exceptional talents put them miles ahead of the competition. The oceanic path to the Farsal archives had been cleared, and soon, humanity might begin to reclaim the actual history of the multitude of Federation species. Memory Transcription Subject, Slanik, Venlo Space Corps Date, Standardized Human Time, January 16, 2137 the infected predators were whisked out of the research station, and away from the Battle of Millo to be isolated in quarantine. The Colchians had been holding the inner sanctum of the system, since the human fleet was mainly composed of Duerden allies. With the goal of a cured Terran race making itself evident, sending rescue teams for the Doser prisoners was inadvisable. That would need to await proper biohazard gear, which would take days, if not weeks, to arrive. Earth was making preparations for itself and its colonies to counter bioterrorist measures. Marcel wanted nothing to do with me during our ride to the quarantine station. The cured humans would be kept isolated for study until they determined whether the disease was communicable. Initial observations didn't suggest transmissibility through close contact, though it wasn't clear if other means could spread the virus. All of us relinquished blood samples for a scientist team to peruse. Tests were run to determine the extent of the allergic reactions, and doctors came prepared to treat anaphylaxis. My blood work was the only one that came back allergen-free, it had been determined that the human-tailored bioweapon couldn't cross the species' border to other sapients. 
As such, I didn't have to worry about any modifications to my genome, and I was free to leave at any time. The medical staff became primarily Zerulian too, after this development was confirmed. Nobody has brought up my execution of the Colchian prisoner, but it's a matter of time. Has Marcel not been feeling well enough to raise the alarm? Concern for the redhead was the reason I hadn't vacated the facility, no matter what, having him in this situation strained my heart. I wandered up to a Zerulian medic, who was conversing with a human in biohazard gear. The quadruped swiveled around, and his face jogged some faint recognition in my mind. Had I seen this individual before? No, what mattered was discovering how Marcel was holding up, since my, former best friend wouldn't speak to me. Slanak, the Zerulian announced. Just the Venlil I was hoping to find. When I heard you and Marcel were among the infected, I had to come. I leaned my head back. We do know each other. You were there, at the Battle of Earth helping to save his family. Your name is... Wylan. You might remember my wife, Freysa, too. We wound up living on Earth after the war, sharing notes on human and alien physiology with top experts. Freysa ducked out from within a cabinet. The Zerulian exchange program was a great way to get to learn what the predators are really like. They don't deserve this. I understand how close you were with your human, Slanak. Mine is into gardening, gardening, for fun. A predator. I don't give a shit. We met for about an hour, months ago, we're not friends. Cool. My tail twitched with irritation star. Asterisk, could you guys tell me how Marcel is doing? Wyland squinted. You haven't asked him yourself? Oh, of course I have. I just mean from a doctor's perspective, what's going on biologically? I'm worried, and I wouldn't want to ask in front of him. You might not be as straightforward if it's bad news. Walk with me. I have to deliver these fever-reducing medicines to the sick ones, Fraser replied. The short version is, the virus inserts DNA into the human genome, which induces desired immune reactions to specific meat-based proteins and enzymes. The severity varies from person to person. Wyland trotted after his wife. I was just talking about Marcel's blood work, I want to help him. What Freysa is saying, is that some humans may only react severely to meat and egg foods. Others are more sensitive to lesser things they eat, like animal lactation, boiled animal tendons in gummies, or even things they wear like cured hides. They put what in gummies? I shrieked. I thought you knew. Forget it, doctor. How does this relate to Marcel? Marcel's blood shows signs of an especially sensitive reaction, Freysa commented. It could be because he's vegetarian, so some of the proteins are particularly foreign to his body. Wylan pawed at a semicircular ear. I'm sure you don't like to think this about your friend, but predatory items pervade human culture, far beyond diet. His furniture and his clothes are probably animal-sourced. Their medicine, a nurturing field by definition, is no longer safe to him, he won't be able to get egg-based vaccines. I was informed by a human colleague that even cosmetics for dry skin and shoe polish might be off-limits. Treatments for dry skin trigger the cure? I blinked in confusion, unable to believe the predatory items ran that deep with my human. Why? because of a wool grease called lanolin. Look, he's going to need to be very careful. Our simulations suggest extreme cases like Marcel can't even breathe the vapors of cooking meat without triggering anaphylaxis. Freysa slipped a pill packet under a door. Wylan and I were shocked, realizing how deep hunting runs in the fabric of human society, it's almost better not to know. What do you think should be done, dear? I think it might be best for Marcel to live on a Federation world, if he needs to avoid animal products altogether. Maybe you could offer to take him in, Slanik, on Venlil Prime? My legs locked up, and left me unable to follow the Zerulian medics. Wylan and Freysa whirled around, 
noting the shock on my features. Since Marcel didn't consume meat in the first place, I figured the cure wouldn't affect his daily life at all. It was within my knowledge that he ate some animal products, such as the revolting lactation juice Wylan mentioned, but I figured those could be cut out of a diet too. It wouldn't be that big of an adjustment, given that my human already avoided them around me. But now, I realized something as simple as his slick couch, in his earthly home, would induce the allergic reaction. Marcel couldn't go to social events with other humans, if breathing in the scent of flesh would place him in jeopardy. That would have precluded hanging out around Tyler, or being in the service at all. The vegetarian's military days were over, it didn't seem fair that his ordinary life was ruined too. Shit, if he got sick, he couldn't seek some treatments at a Terran hospital anymore. Poor Marcel will have to think of every little thing, as small as treating chapped lips in the winter. If he stays on his world, I don't know how he can go out in public without risk, but he certainly doesn't want to live with me. I pinned my ears back, searching for an excuse. Marcel has family on earth. He has a life there. It will be, difficult, for his predator relatives and friends to accommodate him. They'd need to be very cognizant, Wyland said. I'm not pressuring you to do anything you don't want to. But if you care about him, you need to tell him what staying on earth means for him. He could wear some breathing mask, and a contact suit? Fraser scrunched her nose. Maybe, but does he want to do that every day of his life? It's a rough situation. Though there is good news, Slana. What, that he's not dead? I'm sorry you're so upset. But the good news is, for the air transmission version, there might be hope of reversing the cure in the near future. The humans have their own gene splicing systems, such as CRISPR. This incident helps them understand the general principles of what the cure adds, so it might help them identify unnatural edits in other species too. I don't care about other species. They don't want it undone, I can fucking tell you that. Marcel does. Well, the humans might be able to undo his gene edits, with proper study. If he chooses to stay away from Earth, it might only be for a little while. His normal life might be restored in a few years, maybe months. Terrans are quick studies. Hearing that the predators could figure out a reversal, without outside assistance, alleviated my guilt for killing Navaris. Clearly, we didn't need any of the prisoners alive to undo the damage. Besides, there were more captives, like the scientist my friend had brought in, who could provide the information Earth sought. That demonic Coltion, who laughed at the idea of destroying Terran culture, deserved a bullet to the head. Marcel was unreasonable, but other humans might be more rational. Maybe I was fretting over one man's skewed morality. I chewed on what the Zerulian doctors imparted. You qualified the hope of reversing the cure as being for the airborne version. Does that mean the other humans, from the research station, are incurable? We didn't say that, but the injected serum is much harder to cure, Wylan proclaimed. I think that's why the Coltians favor that method, when given a choice. They transmit the virus directly into the bloodstream, and also inject certain proteins and enzymes into the skin, to spark allergies the old-fashioned way. I see. So they're permanent herbivores. Permanence a strong word, slanic. Curing the genetic side would prevent the disease from being passed to offspring, at least. Fraser flicked her ears. Besides, I expect you would know, as a vegetarian's friend, even if those people are eating grass, humans are still violent predators. The Coltians succeeded in pissing them off, not gentling them. Right. What makes them human is that they're insane, Wylan remarked. So, my Venlal buddy, are you able to break the news to Marcel for us? He deserves to know right away, and it would be better coming from you. A friend. Well. My throat clammed up with guilt, not wanting to reveal our relationship's dire straits. Selfishly, all I wanted was to see and comfort Marcel during this revelation, I could brainstorm a plan to ease my entry into his room. Yes. 
I'll tell him. Excellent. Well, his door is right here, I'll leave you to the unpleasantries. My eyes widened with alarm as the Zerulians pushed me through a plastic isolation flap. It hadn't occurred to me that the conversation's timetable would be accelerated, I hadn't realized we were walking past Marcel's room while I was distracted worrying about him. Wylan and Fraser watched with expectancy, giving encouraging ear flicks. Nausea twirled in my belly as I didn't dare explain what happened between us. My paw issued a tentative knock before I twisted open the sealed door. The red-haired predator studied me with lethargic eyes, perspiration lining his skin. He shifted on the bed, and curled his lip with displeasure. A booming cough racked his body, causing him to fall back against the pillow. A pitcher of water had been nearly drained, he hadn't been able to get up to refill it at the filtration sink. Hi Mark, I offered. A low groan came from his mouth. Go, away. Please, let me get you some water. I can't leave you like this. I scurried over to the pitcher, feeling my heart rate hit an all-time high. Chiding myself not to drop the glass and look like more of a fool, I carted it over to the spout. The water filled the jug with the speed of molasses, and my tail swished across the floor with impatience. Temptation overtook me, so I risked a glance at Marcel. The human's face looked puffy, it was clear his immune system was in overdrive. I wish that I could curl up next to him, and make him feel better. I miss having such a wonderful friend. Those hazel eyes struggled to stay focused on me, which caused sympathy to tug at my heart. I balanced the full pitcher with new determination, pressing it to his lips. The rift between us felt palpable, as Marcel reluctantly accepted the hydration for his own sake. Even in his discombobulated state, I could see that he hadn't forgotten what I did. Fury was causing him to distance himself from me, I got the sudden feeling my lie had been what pushed him over the edge. I was asked to tell you something, by the Zerulian doctors, I spoke hurriedly, while setting the pitcher down on the table. Your reaction to the cure is severe. The doctors don't think you should live on earth for a while. They said you'd be deathly allergic just smelling meat or touching animal products, like apparently, your couch. Which I slept on. Marcel didn't speak a word. Even in his listless stupor, his binocular eyes managed to level me with intensity. I noticed a slight lump pass down his throat, he was either swallowing down hurtful thoughts or thirst. The human, who'd become the faithful friend my world revolved around, just wanted me gone. That stung worse than the prickle of a thousand thorns, but I was glad we hadn't quarreled again. With legs that felt as heavy as stone, I trudged toward the door. It was impossible not to feel the predator's gaze boring into my spine. His judgment punished me, as if he were the aggrieved party in the Navarus execution. Part of me was angry about the Terran's mandatory policy on mercy, but I couldn't berate him in this sorry state. At the end of the day, I cared about Marcel. What I said to him back on the research station was accusatory and less than kind, though it was true enough. If this was the last time we ever spoke to each other, I didn't want to cut contact with hurtful words. Perhaps he could learn to remember our adventures with some fondness, in time. This hadn't been how I wanted our close as brothers bond to fizzle out. I'm sorry that they did this to you. I kept my back turned to the human, resting a paw on the door handle. You remember why I joined the exchange program? I read your book, Frankenstein. About a monstrosity who only wanted a friend, or acceptance, and was hated and abused by the world. Judged for his appearance. There was nothing but silence from the human, and the certain feel of his watchful gaze. Without looking, I could feel the dazed rhythm of his blinks. How had I ever feared that Marcel would harm me? He couldn't dole out punishment to the people that deserved his wrath, let alone to anyone he called a friend. I felt sorry for the creature. For you. And maybe, in some weird corner of my brain, I was curious what it was like to be a monster, I continued. Now, I know that I am one too, just not one of appearances. 
Maybe the book was trying to say that the real monsters were the ones who wronged the physical monster. I hope you'll find someone who sees you for what you truly are, because I can't do it anymore. My paw cracked the door ajar, and I slumped my shoulders in the entryway. This went against everything that my heart desired, pulling away from the only person I thought I truly knew. The reality was that I had changed too much, Marcel didn't sign up to be partners with someone he saw as a monster. If I could go back to how things used to be between us, I would. Now, I had nobody to turn to. A faint growl rumbled behind me. That whole plot you saw was bogus. The real ending, of that book. Not the censored one the UN doctored up. Do you know what it is? My head whipped around. What? You changed it? Of course we did. It's a vengeful story, not one where Frankenstein's monster is innocent and lives alone with another of his kind. The real tale? Suffering immensely from rejection, the creature strives to take everything from his creator that he ever loved. After the death of his maker occurs, the wretch commits to end his own life of unhappiness in turn. That's, my blood ran cold, as I tried to decipher what lesson such a story could tell. That was in stark contrast to a story that garnered sympathy from the viewers, it proved the point that the monster was a monster. I don't understand. Humans changed it because we wanted you to take the message that we could be friends. We weren't trying to vow vengeance for our rejection then. But maybe we should have left the message that there are consequences, for such inhumane and callous treatment of a monster. It's fitting, in hindsight. That doesn't sound like something you would say, Mark. I took one hesitant step back toward the Terran, and noticed that he had averted his eyes. You never want consequences. Fuck, you think I don't want the bastards to pay for all of these horrible things? I have, suffered plenty too. You seem to forget. Then why, why do you let every bad person we come across get away with everything? I don't. Read the book, and maybe you'll understand. Here, I've had a copy in Venlo script on me, ever since I knew you liked it. I wasn't sure about giving it to you, but now I am. The human rummaged through a satchel near his bedside, and weakly held it out with a hand. I inched closer, pulling it from his slender fingers. There's also a lesson for the monster in there. In his revenge, the monster damned himself too. I know from Sovlin that that was almost me. I lied to you. Can we ta? No. Come back when you've finished the book, and then, we'll talk. I, need to rest. And process my family's future. My tail flicked in a gesture of acceptance, and I plodded out of his quarters with a lighter heart. Marcel didn't sound as angry, his voice was choked with tiredness, but his hatred had evaporated. Perhaps the human didn't have the energy to project his grudge, though I wasn't going to complain if that was the reason. It must be a lot for him to reckon with, learning how the cure would wreck his entire life. He still hadn't complained or exploded with emotion. I have no idea how he really feels, but I guess I've started to assume he doesn't experience hate. He's just always so, moral. My claw traced the cover of the real Frankenstein, wondering how it could apply to my own feelings of monstrousness. Maybe I was ready for the lessons humanity hadn't wanted the Venlil to absorb in the beginning. I had fallen far enough to heed teachings meant for the more depraved minds among predators. Regardless, I was curious to see what the full narrative held in its pages. If this was a slight chance to salvage my friendship with Marcel, it was a no-brainer to seize it. Memory Transcription Subject, Chief Hunter Isif, Arxer Rebellion Command Date, Standardized Human Time, January 16, 2137 Presiding over thousands of Arxer rebel ships, I found myself in a more familiar role than managing interpersonal relations with social leaf lickers. The Colchians towed a sizable force of their own, and our censors were able to confirm they were following us into Harchin territory. Secretary General Zhao's proclamation that the enemy possessed drones was eye-opening, we needed to catch up technologically, if we wished to contend with the main powers. 
the Dominion didn't truly want to win, so they were content to remain stagnant. This command ship is only a support ship, so it's not a proper frontline war vessel. What's important is that I'm in the thick of things and calling the shots. Fal was guarded by human encampments, who were unflinching as we warped into real space. I conversed with a UN commander briefly, before patching our forces into one comms channel. The pack predators were masters of coordinated action, and it would be useful to hear their insights during the battle. The Terrans were the only race that wanted to end the war, as proven by the Dominion and Commonwealth teaming up to keep the fray going. I was pleased to be fighting alongside the primates at last, for the first time since I saved Earth. It had taken half a day's travel to reach the Harchin homeworld, after mobilizing the rebel forces in a rush. The enemy possessed faster warp engines than us, so their emergence would be shortly behind our own. We couldn't stop without committing to a fight, and that meant my team needed to stay on duty. Kaisal was growing cagey, stuck around Felra and the chatty humans. On the opposite paw, Olek and Lisa looked a little nostalgic, looking out the window toward the occupied planet. I spent a lot of time here researching whether the Harchin dabbled in AI. Humans have had AIs that could write songs and poetry for over a century, Olek remarked. Someone had to come up with something more, a true, sapient AI. Lisa rolled her eyes. You don't think it's already been invented at home? It's unlikely. Meyer would have used it to interface with the Fed dies if so. I knew Elias Meyer, and he did not seem the hiding type. My nostrils flared, as I strained to tolerate the scruffy conspiracy theorist. The Colchians are closing in on us, with the intent to eliminate everything we've worked for, and you're spouting your nonsense, Olek? Yeah. Would you rather I say we should get our wills in order? Wills? I do not follow. Your last will. You know, the document stating what you wish to be done with your assets after your death. Why the fuck would you care what happens to your belongings after you die? You can't use them or gain from it because the people you love are still there, and you want them to be taken care of after you're gone. If I die in battle, my meager credits are going to a Venlil foster mother who adopted a human. That's the kid I mentioned earlier, you know, and I still want him to succeed in a world where I'm not around." Lisa offered a solemn nod. My possessions are to be divided among my family. I recorded a message for them to see, if I'm Kia. HSS. Love this, care that. You humans wish to talk others' ears off even after you're dead? Kaisal hissed. You won't see them receive it. It's not like they can send a response to your decomposing corpse. I raised my snout diplomatically. Unlike most Arxer, humans are upset at a loved one's passing. Irrationally so. That applies to me, first realizing I was defective by mourning my parents' death. I see the human's points about wills, I'd want my doser friend to be okay in my absence. You would be upset if I, died, right, Siffy? Felra asked from my shoulder. No, I risked everything to save you because I didn't care if you died. Sarcasm dripped from my voice, and I focused on some last-minute battle calculations. You know that answer. You just want me to fawn over you like a human. Maybe I do. We're about to go to war. I'm, a, a mechanic. The fighting at my research station was scary enough. Kaisal gave an audible scoff, picking up on the rodent's stutter. I had an inkling that the scrawny advisor would latch onto this as proof that all herbivores were frightful animals. While I wanted to show solidarity with Felra, just despite the bigoted Arxer, displaying empathy didn't come naturally to me. How did other sapients express understanding of fear? The only response I was familiar with was mockery. Tensions brewing minutes before combat was less than ideal, regardless. Lisa eyed Kaisal warily, while Olek minded his own stomach. The human fished a stout stick of meat from his pocket, which he had to be forceful to tear with his flat teeth. Felra gasped, 
and I only then remembered how the Federation abhorred this. Scaring my doser friend worse than avoidable was the last thing I wanted, my job was to protect her. The previous time she tried to observe us eating meat, it culminated with her puking, despite sincere efforts at tolerance. Alexei Bondarenko. Don't you dare consume flesh in front of Felra. I snarled. The human stopped mid-bite. Sorry. Wasn't thinking. Let me just wolf it down real quick, so it's gone. A growl rumbled in my chest, as the UN soldier turned his back to hide the jerky. Felra leapt from my shoulder, making me wince at the sizable drop for her small legs. I assumed that she was fleeing from what was an atrocious sight in her culture, while I bore witness to herbivore reactions before, I never cared to understand their primal feelings. Avoiding the subject recently was one of my prouder judgment calls. I'd eaten meals alone, sending the humans to their own quarters too, to keep carnivory out of the dosser's eyes. I make sure that she has everything she needs, but I know enough to keep our nutrition processes separate. It's better that way. Felra couldn't run off too far, so I tailed her with purposefully slow movements. Kaisel's dilated pupils tracked the rodent, as she skittered over Olek's boot. The Arxer's hunting drive must be triggered by the fleeing prey, I was close enough to intercept my advisor if needed. Rather than running past the conspiratorial human, the doser had parked herself atop his laces. Her whiskers twitched, and she stared up at the jerky stick. Can I? Felra's eyes twinkled with uncertainty, and she paused for several seconds. Can I try that, Olek? The brown-haired human spit out his mouthful in shock. What? Can I try your flesh meal? Unless it's an affront to steal your feast. Despite the impending battle, I was utterly distracted by the unfolding scene. My maw was slackening with disbelief, and I replayed what Felra just asked. The doser were natural herbivores, not a cured race, herbivores licked leaves. That was the Dominion's entire basis for considering them non-sapient. Why would the rodent want to consume something so taboo, and out of her diet's bounds? Lisa and Olek, having spent months around Venlil and then Harchen, both seemed to be having difficulty processing Felra's request. They must have familiarity with the typical Federation response to meat-eating, which was to decry it as an abomination of nature. Kaisal looked like he was about to burst at the seams, wheezing from a lack of breath. His eyes fixed upon the doser like she was a defective of her own right. Why? Olek managed. Felra swished her little tail. I'm curious. There must be a reason you ignore what carcass food is, when you're capable of eating plants. The male human shot a glance at me. While I wasn't violent, I think both the primates understood that anyone who was a threat to Felra would find themselves on the wrong end of my claws. Uncertain of myself, I gave him a slight nod of approval. The dosser's reaction tickled my own curiosity, though I was worried she would puke it up. It never crossed my mind that she'd want to try meat, let alone learn to tolerate seeing it. Lisa interceded. Hold on. She doesn't have the enzymes to digest it. It won't kill her without the allergy, but we don't want to make her sick. Good point. Olek inspected the side of the stick he hadn't bitten from, and snapped off a small morsel. She's also tiny, so I'll give her a teensy bite. Here, Felra. The doser rose to her hind legs, grabbing the piece. Thank you for sharing. I, I hope this will help me understand predators better. Why are you wasting your rations, human? Food is too precious to throw away, Kaisal hissed. Olek raised a nonchalant eyebrow. Even so-called herbivores eat meat on earth. I don't see the issue. It's prey. It can't eat real food, it is the food. Fury surged in my heart like a wave in a tempest. I launched myself at Kaisal, feeling my blinding temper get the best of me. The scrawny arxer was slammed into the sensor's console, which indicated that the Colchian force was less than a light year out. However, 
the perils of combat meant nothing compared to someone calling Felra food. I thrashed my tail against his own, eliciting a crack from the bone. My fangs brushed against his throat, and traced their way down his windpipe. I, HRR, will kill you. This is your final warning, I growled. I told you never to speak to her like that again. And you said you'd do whatever I said when you took this role. Pain laced Kaisel's pants. I misspoke. You sure as cruelty did. Insolence is inexcusable for my underlings, you can thank the prey for you getting one last chance. Don't make me make her see what I'll do with your corpse. I won't, your savageness. I released the Arxer, who barely suppressed a yelp as his fractured tail smacked the floor. There would be no medical treatment for Kaisal, when the wounds were intended as punishment. I didn't want to follow Betterment's execution policy, but I'd lose control of my people with too much leniency. Besides, Felra's welfare was an area I didn't take any risks with, there would be no mercy when she was disrespected. Olek looked at me with wide eyes. Are you good? I expected a more loyal, obedient second out of a defective, that's all, I huffed. Sorry, Felra. Assuming you still want to, you can eat your, gift from the human. Uh, unless he's gonna wall slam me if you don't like it? I will most likely not. I do not wish to scare off humans when I need your alliance. Is that not obvious? Lisa raised an eyebrow. You like us. Admit it. I tolerate you. I cannot cause bodily harm to you at will, even when you call me a softy. As pleasant as it would be to disprove this notion, Zhao would notice your absences if he checked in. Aha. Uh -huh. Sure, big man. Meanwhile, you let Felra believe you were human, because you wish you were one of us. Your words. HSS, for what it's worth, I wish I was human as well, Kaisal offered, with a sour note in his voice. To have the luxuries you take as guarantees. That is what we are fighting for, unless you've forgotten, I spat. Regardless, I will not harm the leaf-licking primates unless they endanger Felra. The doser dismounted Olek's shoe. So I'm good to go. Here goes nothing. Felra was holding the jerky like it burned to the touch, but slowly brought it closer to her face. Summoning her courage, she managed a tiny nibble. The doser passed the predator food around in her mouth, and her eyes rolled back with thought. It was surprising that she didn't spit it out at once. In fact, she swallowed it down without gagging. That's something I never thought I'd see an herbivore undertake, without being tortured into doing so. It must be a big deal to Felra, even the humans look like they're watching history. I resisted an odd urge to collect her. How are you feeling? Like I really want you to pet me, Felra shot back. You little, I defended your honor and now I try to be nice and care about you. After all that, you rehash this degrading nonsense to rile me up? Be gone, rodent. Kaisel's eyes lit up. You want the, um, rodent gone? May I remove the dose sir through the airlock? What? No. I don't actually want her gone, you unworthy runt. But you just said, I don't follow. Sorry. Read the room, Olek chimed in. Isif says he wants her out of his sight, or that he's regretting not leaving her at Milo, at least once a day. Lisa nodded. And means the opposite. Felra skittered over to her water saucer. To answer your question, Siffy, I feel okay, the taste was very strong, and it lingers. The texture felt phony. I don't know if I like it, but I think it's best to wash it down. Having been distracted long enough by the deranged dose sir, I resumed my watchfulness for the Colchians pursuing us. It seemed doubtful that the UN forces padding our ranks would deter them from snuffing us out. An Arxer seeking peace was the worst thing that could happen to the Federation, in Nikonis eyes, it surpassed the damage that human benevolence had done to their goals. Olek and Lisa found their posts in the nick of time, 
readying themselves to pass along relevant insights. Kaisal nursed his wounded tail, and verified that our assets were ready for action. Commanding an entire fleet did seem easier with multiple sets of eyes, rather than making decisions without any assistance. I hopped away from my post for a brief second, scooping Felra up. The doser had been keeping her distance, to avoid distracting me. They're almost here. You need to focus, the doser said. You don't want me to stay out of your F, scales? I sighed. You've never been in space combat. I wouldn't want you to be scared alone. We are in this together, yes? You're so sweet, Siffy. Together, thousands of enemy ships were ripped from subspace, as they encountered humanity's FTL disruptors around FAL. I prepared to communicate with my forces, and the doser perching on my shoulder gave me confidence. For the first time, an Arxer was going to see what the Federation were truly capable of. Two predator species, with a guest herbivore among them, needed the power to overcome the Colchians. Anything short of absolute victory would discredit my prowess beyond repair. The United Nations reissued the command to hold our positions, and we waited for the Commonwealth to wade into whatever traps the humans packed around Fowl. After seeing the buffs given to the Soul System, I suspected Terran made defenses would offer some interesting surprises. Automated Colchian vessels forged ahead, fearless against any hidden technology. The primates took no actions to prevent them from closing in on the Harchin homeworld and our joint formation. As an ambush predator, the basic cues screamed trap, although I couldn't figure out the details. It was odd how the Terrans positioned us so deep within their turf, this was proof that Zhao trusted me not to launch an opportunistic assault against the Harchin. However, I was the only non-human party who assessed anything was amiss. The Colchian fleet continued pushing toward the edge of orbital range, and readying target locks on Arxer-built ships. The humans are not doing anything. How sure are we that it's not a setup? They could be working against us too. Kaisal barked. I flared my nostrils. They're on our side. Whatever they're really up to, it's hiding in plain sight. It is. Lisa pointed out the viewport, to the life-bearing world we were clustered around. More like hiding in the biggest object in sight. Staring at Fowl's emerald surface and vaporous clouds, many signatures were visible, rising through the upper atmosphere. Standard air defenses didn't climb that high, they were only meant to counter raids and troop landings. A full understanding hadn't established itself, but I cackled when I guessed what the humans were intending. The planet, which was supposed to be a soft target against orbital strikes, was their weapon of choice. With the Earth-born predators, offense and protection were undertaken in the same breath. Human resourcefulness often impressed me, with their ability to view space strategy from new angles and compensate for their deficits. That out-of-the-box thinking might be all that could stop the Colchians from crippling our insurgency in its infancy. I hoped that, once the dust settled, this plan would shake out in our favor.